Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams Deep Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And today, we're coming at you, of course, with a brand new episode. We're reviewing two new albums, two big albums, one of which probably one of the most anticipated records of the entire year for a lot of people, that being Lizzo. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I mean, fucking sure, why not? Uh, the follow-up <laughs> to Black Midi, uh, their beloved sophomore record last year, which we did review Cavalcade, of course, with our returning guest, Adequate Emily. We are coming back with the sequel to that episode, I guess, with yes. uh, a review of Black Midi's Hellfire, of course. And we're going to be reviewing the follow-up to the very successful Cause I Love You, Lizzo's new album, Special. Exactly. And we're also doing a Record Club episode. Big moment for us because it is our 100th Record Club episode of this show. We're talking about the Wonder Years album, The Greatest Generation, a great record that we all have a lot of affection for. Needs a whole lot more attention just in general. So go check that out yeah. when that finally drops. And say uh, This week on the channel, we have a couple new videos here for you, most recently of which we did uh, a fun new video where we talk about our favorite breakup songs uh the three of us talk we have like three kind of core picks that we all discuss uh ones that are a little bit left of the dial ones that aren't talked about as much very quintessentially us kind of picks uh go check that out uh mm -hmm. if you so desire and we also last week's record club we talked about slipknot's album iowa and yes. how we actually all think that album kind of kicks ass yes. so if you that's the one i always hear people. about i never listened to slipknot but that's always the one i hear like where people are like if you're going to get into slipknot you have to start there you have to start at iowa if, yeah if you like death metal that's the shit also this week on the channel we are very <laughs> excited to start a new series a new retrospective on oh. the national uh which we're very excited we've we just finished our Bjork retrospective the entire discography across nine videos super proud of that being done that being an achievement you can check that out on the channel right now and we are going to be kicking off with the nationals first album on friday this coming friday so stick around for that uh, make sure that you are catching up today if you haven't listened to all their records and you can follow along with us and yeah so lots of cool stuff happening at the moment lots of cool stuff in the pipeline as well this is the 98th main episode of our show so we have a uh, something very special a few very special things planned for the 100th episode in a couple of weeks but Enough of that. Let's get into what we've been listening to for the last seven days. As per usual, Jake, what have you been listening to? Well, I've been listening a lot to, uh, I, we've mentioned this guy tons of times on here. One of my favorite music writers, one Mr. Stephen Hyden. Uh, I've been listening to his podcast, Rivals, uh, which is sort of a spinoff from a book he wrote about famous uh, sort of music rivalries between bands, between artists, between like all kinds of stuff, just because I find this shit fascinating. And I uh, basically like I any fucking like incarnation of like, just, just, I just love hearing people who are more knowledgeable than me tell me about petty shit that happened like 30 years ago. But one of the rivalries that got me to listen to some music, uh, one that I was interested in just because I didn't really know a whole lot about this relationship, despite being a big fan of one of the artists, is the rivalry between uh, Trent Reznor and Marilyn Manson. And I was interested Ooh. in this just because I am, of course, a huge Nine Inch Nails fan. And I knew that these two artists were kind of related and shared a kind of like I knew that Trent had produced uh, uh, one of their, their albums, uh, one yeah. of his albums. And I will say, as canceled as Marilyn as it is, some of his early work kind of slaps. Like, I'm not going to say Hollywood's a bad album. I listened to this, and it was interesting to hear these two presences being compared, because you get the, the, the sort of impression that Reznor is kind of a mentor figure for... Uh, Manson, who just sort of like came and sort of wanted to occupy a similar space as him and was like trying to make music and then eventually like gave Reznor a tape that have ultimately inspired him to collaborate with Manson. And uh, they had like a really longstanding like friendship and relationship, but it was when Reznor was 
really off the deep end with like heroin and alcohol and Man- Manson was like in a very similar place. They were doing all of the like really- Manson had a really rough period in the 2000s, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Like his music got talking weird, about, everything got weird. He looked sweaty yeah, in every about, interview. about like putting needles under his fingernails and shit, just all kinds of stuff. And like, there was one time where eventually they were like pulled up in the studio together and like they had some sort of a falling out when they were both just absolutely like piss drunk and Trent Reznor took a fucking hammer to one of the hard drives to the master where the masters of one of Marilyn Manson's albums were on. The album at the time uh, was of course, I think the sort of record that kind of, um, really sort was it of like portrait of an american family like, or was it antichrist Superstar? no it was antichrist superstar right. yeah which oh is that's the one that blew him up that, yeah that's the album that i listened to because it is both like critically decently well regarded the album that sort of let him sort of blow up when he was really yeah, that's one of the ones that i remember liking as a teenager and i go back to it now and i go this a lot of this is not age well but some of it i can still see what i saw in it like yeah and uh, when the first track drops an the- n-word in the in the literal yeah. I love literal chorus you're like oh i love this that is it's absolutely called- something. i love i love that it's called irresponsible hate anthem <laughs> when, okay, honestly that's when a little funny I, that's a little funny i gotta give him credit for that to the rivalry episode i had an internal realization that i have heard a lot of marilyn manson's music but never a full album Ever one. That's the thing. So his albums what, are more spotty than his singles, for sure. I I decided to make this my sort of christening, just because yes, Manson, very um, obviously not an endorsement of of him in in rapist, in no, terrible person, way. terrible yeah. person, he, rapist, he's a terrible yeah. person, he's a rapist, fuck him to hell and back. But I was like, I want to develop an opinion on some of his music because I mean, I should, this is from a scene that I, where I like other musicians and if he has a kinship with Trent Reznor, of course, I'll be interested in it. So I listened to Antichrist Superstar and uh, as alluded, you know, maybe Reznor should have done a better job at wrecking the hard drive because I, 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 I fucking, oh, I couldn't stand this shit. I get the appeal, but I also, just hate the way this album sounds so much. It sounds like fuck it. Like the the industrial production is so thin sounding. Like all of the instrumentation is just so like crusty and and, and like it, it just it lacks so much of the impact that you want from music like this. And like, I really try to keep an open mind when exploring um, music like this that is like really like goes for provocation and sort of like, you know, trying to stir shit. And that was kind of his goal here. And that's also kind of like all it is too. Like, I, I understand the sort of place that he had of like, you know, it was kind of like Eminem back then. He was like taking shots. The the 90s sort of had this resurgence of, I think like the, the satanic panic sort of had a second wave where it was sort of aimed at a different thing now. And it was music and entertainment that like embodied Videos. and Manson's goal is to just Doom. like be this. He was like on stage calling uh, Christianity fascist, which I mean, now we think is kind of like, you know, fucking get with the program, dude, we all know. But like back then, probably a bigger thing to have said uh, back in like, back when that was less of a, a, a prevailing trend. The most notable thing I think about Marilyn Manson this time is that how he became kind of the figurehead for the finger pointing at, uh, that happened in the wake of Columbine. Like when I think yeah. of Marilyn Manson, I think of the interviews that he did where after Columbine, where all this press was kind of put on the fact that, you know, the Columbine murderers were huge fans of his music and the music of artists like him. And he kind of ended up becoming the face of backlash against this and the sort of finger pointing. And, and we've mentioned Eminem. The... Eminem stood up for him on yeah. the uh on uh the way I am, which was a huge single too. Yeah, so that's like... a good yeah. point. Yeah. So and... I, it's interesting how like 
Marilyn Manson was such a spokesperson for a particular kind of arguably very necessary and in some ways like incredibly yeah. timely art that came out of the post grunge era uh and like because you know the 90s were this like time of you know what we think of as like this time of relative prosperity and peace where like a lot of the angst that was happening and, and being communicated through the world yeah. and culture came out of like suburban ennui and that sort of thing as opposed to like war which would come to define the, twi- the 2000s and i think P- marilyn Manson's kind of the height of that I would say a fair point to make about him would be like, I mean, his behavior afterwards definitely ruined his, a lot of his music for sure. But also the, some of the people he inspired, like the anti-theist movement definitely ruined. So like when you listen to a song, like fight song now, like you do not realize how wild it would be to turn on the rock station and hear a chorus that says, I'm not a slave to a God that doesn't exist. When you think about that now, you think of a guy with a fedora on Reddit going, Ugh, you, I mean, you, your, your parents believe in God. You should you, you should yell and, at them. And, it's like, and, and the <laughs> thing is, like, Trent Reznor was doing that 10 years earlier on Head Like a Hole, the, which is a song about the same sort of thing, about, like, commercialism, capitalism, and God. And, I mean, well, that's the thing I was going to say about Fight Song is, like, which is not on Antichrist Superstar, but is part of that trilogy that yeah. he released. Of, and uh, But... I mean, in the background of that, there is something still a bit radical of making a song about, like, suburban destruction and then literally titling it, like, oh, hey, here's a metaphor for all the kids that don't make it in football who end up with, like, debilitating injuries because we aren't actually paying and taking care of them because parents are forcing their will on them. And I'm like, that's actually a decent metaphor for, like, dumb schlock like on the dumber side of schlock industrial you know like (laughs) yeah anyway jake what else have you been listening to this week i heard a really really interesting album that i have never heard anyone talk about just because this feels like really rate your music core kind of shit but i was going through lots of like post-rock stuff uh the other week and just like downloading tons of stuff that i've never heard of before and one of them is an album from an artist called World's End Girlfriend. And it is the album mm. Hurt Break Wonderland. And this shit is fucking crazy. Let me just list for you uh, some of the genres that are on this particular release. Because... I kind of looked at it and just had to, on principle, listen to this just to see what it sounded like. It is post-rock, modern classical, glitch, breakcore, electronic, modern classical, chamber jazz. And it is this big 70 minute plus record of like all the songs are like 10 minutes long and they're all like, there's like 13 minute long songs, 10 minute long songs, like all of this shit. And like some of them are like really peered back post-rock folk like gentle sort of eastern influenced kind of sound that's like really plaintive and then there's also songs on here like the 13 minute long 100 years of choke which is just insane break core and then like weird like steely dan shit and then like glitch shit and then it's like harsh noise and it's just like this album is just fucking relentless and it's relentless for almost 80 minutes so naturally people who are you know on the the lesser end of like if you're if you if you don't like getting thrown around i can't promise you that this is going to do a whole lot for you but if you just want an experience that's like really instrumentally proficient and like produced well and like this is a really emotional album that's the biggest like selling point i can give it is that this is a very emotionally tangible record and i feel like that can be felt even in its most instrumentally oblique moments so go check this out if you just want a wholly overwhelming maximalist experience from like every sense this sounds like exactly my sort of shit post-rock modern oh. classical break core fucking all of these tags and shit yes. like there's no way i'm not gonna fucking yeah. dig this 
as it reminds and this artist me of, like, made a bunch of records that are really well regarded too and this is only one of them yeah. so like it reminds me of something damn. like a, like what hundred gex did for bubblegum bass or like what uh what like stomach book did for like emo where it's like basically i'm gonna take this genre and i'm just gonna shove everything i can find in there is that a record scratch put that in there random talking noises yes break core beats yes <laughs> screaming section yes death metal chords yes like <laughs> also like the combination of modern classical and break core set reminds me very much of venetian snares if you like venetian snares absolutely this is a hundred percent for you like i i can't believe i didn't make that comparison while making it but mm. yes hundred percent one of the most interesting things i've heard all year i want to go back to it but it's also like you know a lot on the briefer end of the spectrum, I wanted to shout out something that I can't believe none of us have done yet, considering how much we love the release uh, of this particular band, is that actually, this is a record we shouted out when Emily was on here last, and that being Gospel's The Loser. Gospel also, this year, right after this album came out, dropped a 20 minute long EP that is one song one song long that is just one big progressive rock movement and it it's is a one like song ep water. with a fucking fiona apple ask title mvd <laughs> yeah. let me read this out here mvdm the magical volumes volume one the magic volume of dark matter or the magic volume of dark matter yeah i think i and think it's a magic volume yeah, I think there's and some, you know what? Yeah. It's it's got a weird this volume. It's pretty magical. With like a multi-armed clown and like I, I expected this to be weird and you know what? It fucking delivered. This if if you love the fact that gospel have gone in a more progressive direction, then this is going to be 100% your bag because this is like psych rock keyboard dream theater-esque prog shit and it's just fucking sensational for an, a band that up until this year had only had barely not even 40 minutes of material and have now more than like doubled that their entire discography just by this ep and their new record this is just absolutely sensational to me and it, since it has volume one at the end of it i can only hope that what is coming is like another EP or a series of EPs that will follow in this stead, which I am more than happy to, uh, I will receive with open arms. So yes, gospel have done it again, folks. Uh, a, a no less impressive release by my measure, uh, just terrific stuff all around. I went back and listened to, like, I listened to a lot of like ambient stuff this week, just because at the beginning I needed some some good soothing shit and i listened to some like vaporwave stuff just because i'd never really listened to that kind of stuff before um but what i ended up revisiting was something that is definitely not vaporwave but is a album that definitely got a lot of attention when it came out but it is the album windswept adan by ichiko eoba who may it's like this combination of like plaintive folk ambient very pastoral feeling record and it didn't really do that much for me when it came out and now that I listen to it with fresh ears I don't know what the fuck was wrong with me because this shit's beautiful oh my god it was exactly what I needed this is like it really gives a great feeling of progression like you really do feel like you're being guided along a journey when listening to this album the album cover is really evocative just for the image of someone naked swimming in the ocean with like really like bright sunlight coming through and that's sort of what the album sounds like uh it's really really beautifully produced and made it made me want to check out a lot of her other stuff just because mm -hmm. she's an artist who has a catalog yeah. that is worth checking out but this is absolutely a record that deserved all of the attention in the world just because this is the kind of music that doesn't really get like a lot of buzz around it's typically like you know plainly beautiful eastern folk music just doesn't sound like it's something that makes rounds in the discourse or whatever so if you ever missed that or just sounds like something that would be appealing to you i highly recommend listening to it it was a very serene experience that i 100 percent needed this week uh, great like uh, low-key video game music as well like if you want to play like 
Celeste or Subnautica or something, then that's a great yeah. album to put on and just kind of like. I mean, have... if you've been following my Twitter in the last few weeks, you know I've been playing a lot of video games, but admittedly that one has a soundtrack that's hard great to turn video off. game music. Yeah. Yeah, Dawn in the Adan is was one of my favorite songs of 2020, but it was just such a stacked year that it, I couldn't even put it in my uh, year in songs list because of just so much great music. But yeah, that yeah, is a really right. special album. And it came in December of 2020 as well. So it's kind of easy to overlook a little bit, um, but it is a record that holds up. And Ichika Eoba has become like a very beloved online musical figure who has a lot of really, really beloved music. Uh, her album Zero, I, get, I hear getting a lot of praise very frequently as well. I've had that recommended to me by a number of people. It's a big uh, Brett core and Jacob Sanchez core record as well. So I need oh. to check that one out because everyone who has recommended that to me has said that it's like one of the best things I've ever heard. So <laughs> I need to get on that. On the note of overlooked 2020 records, funnily enough, is this week I listened to uh, the first solo album of the greatest band of all times, front man, Greg Pucciato's child soldier, creator of God. I like, I swear to God, Jake, if you do anything less than four star this, and that's me being conservative, I don't know you anymore. I, I saw that it was like metal and like math core and also like dark wave. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's not, I wouldn't describe it as a metal album at all, really. Uh, there's lots of strong industrial it's it the, the album is so all over the place by design some of the best tracks on here are like straight up synth pop uh, so Sick. sounds like it's like a logical maybe a logical next step from what some of the stuff they were doing on dissociation yeah it definitely feels like the the record that a guy involved with dissociation might make afterwards i am over the moon for this thing I, I wouldn't say it's as good as really any of the dillinger albums i don't think it gets close to ironworks but probably not 100 percent there but uh, the guy is just so experienced he shits and creative he, he wakes up in the morning and he pisses excellence yeah uh <laughs> I mean, he out of every orifice has passed for like pop shit. He's been doing music that has those sort of hooks since the fucking first Dillinger album he was even on. So this feels like an extension yeah. of all the things he's interested in, and maybe was limited by by being in Dillinger. He he he, he pisses excellence. He shits greatness, and he sweats masterpieces. Yeah, that's true. Every bodily um, fluid. Every bodily fluid. <laughs> <laughs> And he, he, he ejaculates seminal releases. <laughs> the point, well, yeah, the, the, the album is also just gnarly as hell at points. Like, it is definitely made by one of the dudes from Dillinger Escape Plan. There's no mistaking that, really. Um, but it just covers so much ground in just a little over an hour. And it's just tasty. I also want to shout out that Greg put out a live album in 2020 called Fuck Content, uh, which is, or Fuck Content, Agreed. depending on how you emphasize it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm unsure. Or Fuck Content? A statement about content. Uh, anyway, it is a, a seemingly a pretty sick live recording. So yeah, and also, of course, Morgan, I think you've mentioned before that he recently put a, a second solo record out as well, Miracell, that yeah, um, last month. seems like it might be worth checking out as well. So I should probably and, catch up with both of those. And he appeared on a single for the electronic art artist Carpenter Brute. His newest album has a lead single called Imaginary Fire with Greg Pucciato on lead vocals. And that shit slaps like a motherfucker. It's so good. Check that out. Also, too. He's also currently on tour with jerry cantrell and they've been singing alice and chain songs oh my and i just god like, <laughs> god that's, is cruel that yeah that's um they can't can, can they do that i mean it's jerry cantrell he can do whatever the fuck he wants 
Uh, anyway, as for what I've li been listening to this week, uh, I haven't actually been listening to very much. It's been a relatively low key week for me in terms of new music. I have started uh, a new job this week. I am teaching multiple different classes at my university now. So it is just a little bit kind of fucking difficult to find time to listen to music at the moment. Uh, but I will shout out a couple of new releases that I listened to that we're certainly not going to be reviewing formally, but I guess are from artists that are relevant to our interests, artists that we, I guess, like is kind of a stretch in the case of one of them. Uh, that being the new album from Jack White, uh, Entering Heaven oh. Alive, uh, Jack's second album this year. Um, it is vastly different to the album he put out earlier this year, Fear of the Dawn, which was an absolute kind of mangled mess of just the weirdest fucking out there guitar shit that Jake, Jake, that Jack has been doing as of late. Whereas Entering Heaven Alive is a much more restrained record. I went into it with the expectation that it was supposedly an acoustic album and it partly is, but also to Jack, to Jack's credit, fuck me. He also has- <laughs> Don't fucking credit me with this man's music. I don't even like him. To Jack White's credit, this new- Okay, but that means you get to be a member of the White Stripes too. Whoa, big shit. To Jack White's credit, he- Feel uh, it. Okay. <laughs> I'm just, I'm being facetious. White Stripes are fine. Good music. <laughs> Whatever. <coughs> Belongs in 2005 where it exists currently. Anyway, to Jack's credit, this new record is not really, calling it an acoustic record is doing it a bit of a disservice because there are some ornate arrangements and it's got some kind of a bit of a chamber pop feel at certain points. There is some diversity. He kind of goes for a bit of a, a kind of a Woody Guthrie kind of classical folk thing at certain points. But the fundamental flaw with this proposition for a Jack White record is that as a personality and as a songwriter, Jack is spent at this particular point in his career. Like, I don't go to Jack White music because I like or am interested in who Jack White is as a person or what he has to say about just about anything. The only reason I would ever listen to Jack White is because I want to hear some kind of wacko, virtuosic, bizarro guitar shit. And the less of himself he puts into that, the more consumable it is. This is Jack doing a very sort of hard on sleeve, very direct sort of singer songwriter record. And as a result of that, I get virtually nothing out of it. There's a couple of decent songs, I suppose. Madman from Manhattan and uh, Help Me Along are pretty good. Uh, there's the very amusingly titled I've Got You Surrounded, parentheses, with my love, uh, which is just like the, cor <laughs> the corniest motherfucking title for a song you could ever write. Is that and a Fallout Boy song? It's actually one of the better songs <laughs> oh, on record, yeah. but I will never listen to it again. It hey, come exists. on, every song title that goes on too long with a terrible pun and like a parenthesis in it is typically a Fallout Boy song. You gotta admit that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what? You're probably right. The other thing I listened to this week that is like, you know, an unremarkable release from an artist that I have some affection for, definitely an artist I have a lot more affection for than Jack White, is that Interpol put a new album out last week. Uh, mm. A new Interpol record is essentially, you know, it's just, it happens every three or four years now, and it is <laughs> another Interpol album. And I was going to say, they kind of... They haven't as they haven't stepped onto the scene in the same way they did in the early 2000s, at least. No, they kind of have more happen now. They kind of like came around at the perfect time. And I yeah. think that Interpol's debut album, I know that um, Jake and August aren't as fond on it as me and Morgan, but that debut album, I think, is like the greatest record of the early 2000s New York City rock resurgence scene. Interpol, I think, demonstrated fairly quickly that they had somewhat of a limited. Uh, range and that was fine for a while like antics i really enjoy our love to admire their major label debut which gets shit on a lot i actually think is a really good record and i listen to it an awful lot uh el pintor from 2014 i thought was really good too their last album marauder was okay but severely hampered by the very poor decision to work with dave fridman and the thing about interpol is that an interpol record needs to sound slick it needs to give weight to the rhythm section and it needs to feel as though it has some kind of just polish to it because that is Interpol. Whereas working with Fridman and doing this very compressed thing only, only ultimately ended up hurting uh, the few good songs that were on that record. And the new record is admittedly much slicker and it has a few songs that 
I guess, incorporate things like piano and some more diverse instrumentation a little bit. But ultimately, the songs are weaker than the ones on Marauder. So it presents, I guess, an even further distillation of the diminishing returns that Interpol have kind of demonstrated in this latter stage of their career. But they are, they don't need to make any more records, really. They're a touring institute. Apparently, they're really huge in Mexico. Like Mexico and Mexican audiences love them for some reason. Like that's where they do their most of their touring and they have most of their chart success. So, you know, good for them. Anyway, uh, Emily, since you're our guest, do you have a couple of one or two recent records that you yeah. have been really enjoying that you want to give a shout out on the show or recommend? Uh, I do, yes. I re-listened to King Ghidorah. Uh, is it Follow the Leader? I always forget the title of it, but it's MF Doom, Take Me to Your Leader. And it's it's so fun like it's just it's one of those records that like it really shows off something that i feel like we all forget because we focus on mf doom's collaborations with people like mad lib and Dan- danger mouse and stuff like that mf doom was a hell of a producer just an incredible mm-hmm. producer and like you listen to a track like phaser i was thinking about it because i was listening to it on my way when i was driving back here for the podcast uh, Next Levels came on because I was re-listening to it a second time this week. And th- that six sax chorus, I listened to it and I was like, am I sure this isn't a instrumental taken from To Pimp a Butterfly? Like it sounded that clean. Like it legitimately felt like you could fit the whole shit don't change it to you. Get up and wash your ass like in there. And it was it would have fit perfectly. It's one of those things where we only got one of those records from MF Doom where it was just mostly him behind the tables and him with various other artists. Like he did produce uh, another album, but this was the one where he did like it this style where he grab bagged a bunch of people and put it on there and focus on the production as the main star of the show. And it's really interesting to see that that contrast with his other work where he's so dense with everything that uh, you often forget to, uh, when you're focusing on his lyrics to focus on the instrumental as much. Even if they are amazing, you, you just are so focused on trying to understand what he's saying because he adds so many layers to stuff that it's really interesting to hear someone else on something he's created and have him put all of his energy in there. And it really expands into this I would say that I'm not sure if there's another Doom project that sounds like Take Me to Your Leader for sure. And it's it's a great record. And I mean, Phasers and Fast Lane are amazing tracks. Like in terms of instrumental, there's so many great stuff. And honestly, good example in here. Monster Zero is one of the few like Doom just like sound collage tracks that I ju- that goes on for like three minutes or so that genuinely is like a track that I would listen to on its own. While like, as much as I love mm, food, there is a decent bit of that album where you're just like, man, all of these sound collages are right next to each other. I, shock in the if, middle. If those food skits were cut out of the middle or just like even better distributed. If they were sprinkled around. That would make <laughs> such a difference to like my overarching feelings I, on that record. I, that, that would be like top tier doom for me. And Actually, it's like firmly at like the top of the mid tier. And it's like let, tantalizing. Let me just, like, let me just ah. be like more harsh and say, cut them all together. That's doom's best record. I I mean we've all kind of you I know think what? at this point I realized that agree with you. It's you know like, what? Oh. I'm with you guys. <laughs> I haven't heard the album. I just felt like I needed to match the enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> and people don't but, yeah. give Doom enough credit for like producing his own instrumentals. Like I feel oh, like yeah. nowadays in the online world, when people talk about Doom, they talk about mad villainy and talk about Doom was the the maddest MC and Mad Lib was the production guy. But Doom was an amazing producer. Like oh, Doom yeah. was incredible at making beats. And M Food is like the best example of that, I think. Like that is the showcase. Now on my listen to this week another rap actor that needs to be shout out my mutual on Twitter. Or I should say, I'm his token white neutral, Gay Guevara's There Will Be No Super Slave. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of you have probably been hearing about this one because yeah. it's been big on um, your music. 
it's like it's, from what I can gather, it's like extremely like online sort of like uh, leftist hip hop sort of thing. And uh, well, Black Bolshevik right? was also that too. Black Bolshevik is amazing, and I mean, it, Black Bolshevik, his album prior to this from last year, literally begins with Ant- a sample of Anthony Fantano saying killed a cop now i'm horny and then just goes into the <laughs> yeah i mean and me too, i mean this man. one begins with like an instrumental thing where you just hear good lord seymour what's happening in there and then you hear oh, patrick God. and then you hear a sample of white supremacists marching down and you're like holy shit <laughs> like he samples the fucking PS3 opening. So, like the little turn. Uh, my only hesitancy with listening to this, because I've read all of these like references and stuff and things, is like, I almost worry that it's going to be like too online for me. Like, no, I feel like it's, this is much more JPEG mafia. Yeah. Like, I feel like this like, is the thing for like, like yeah. 18 year olds as opposed, and I'm like nah. 25, and I already feel like I'm a bit old for this. This is the kind of album that has lines like, they don't want to see us together like a unified Korea. And you're like, oh, <laughs> okay, that's, that's a that is that's kind of a, a hard bar. I'll, I'll, I'll it is, yeah, one. it is. That's a good one. I mean, he, I don't know I'm if I'm horrified to look, or impressed. I have a little bit of reticence with music that like invokes memes that are current and stuff because it's just it's not going to be music that ages particularly well. He got Drake's with two wands, called them bitches Cosmo and Wanda and <laughs> fuck with the kid like the Carl Malone or a little corny. I'll give him that. But <laughs> I mean, someone is like, get on shit. board with that. They're, 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 they're not Denzel Curry, like saying stuff like life's a female dog while I'm perverted level of corny. I, yet, so. I'll tell you what, <laughs> I have a huge amount of respect for naming a song. I personally wouldn't have released John McCain. <laughs> <laughs> he also re- has a song i'm trying to remember what it is it's uh, it's a uh, sean king is not seeing heaven um <laughs> kidnap mark cuban that hide away in cuba i think that uh this is definitely the kind of music that is i suppose funnier and more entertaining in concept than execution for me personally no, and again i say I mean, this it's it's not trying to be funny most of the time like it has those zingers but it also still has like a bunch of lines like that are like seriously like <laughs> political and like stuff like that like it begins off with that sample of that wrestler uh new jack who has that line about like you know to my oh. home bit, boy oj simpson keep up the good work uh, two two less of them and it segues into this line of like stand around the block like a fucking diversity hire leader a leader a liar they grifting for dollars and doing a master class seminars how the fuck is you talking about organization but your demographic is nothing but n words this this is like the best ver- like the those like hard-hitting jpeg lines of mm. like if i'm gonna compare like the you can see those hard hitting like joke titles like in a JPEG album, but occasionally will reach those lines where it's like, this is like police, like riot, like movement, like we're going to push the line forward kind of music of like, fuck you, you're right. And then he'll still have times to just be like honest on there. Like there's a great track called Rayman Legend, Rayman Legends that's just like talking about like bringing the game? home and just yeah <laughs> yes like the game i mean what, what uh, else is game. called rayman legends but it's like talking about <laughs> taking a girl home and just falling deeply in love with her it's like very honest and i really enjoy it like it's an amazing subject matter for a song called rayman legends this bitch play rayman legends i want to hit this is how that he knew she was the one when when, <laughs> when, when she invited him around to play rayman <laughs> I think that uh, JPEG Mafia certainly has ushered in the way for artists like this. And it feels like more and more with each year to me that this is sort of the future of hip hop, essentially. And in five to 10 years, a lot of what these sorts of artists are doing will be mainstream. And so like that, I think, is one of those moments where I have to come to terms with the fact that, yeah, I'm getting I'm getting old. Yeah, the only other album I'll mention is... uh... I was to a few weeks ago, but uh, I mentioned it earlier. Stomach Books, self-titled, is a much less in for most people. I think a lot of people didn't get to hear it last year. Great album that mixes emo and all these great sounds together into this. It's the kind of album that I listened to and went, this could start its own genre in the same way that, like, 
100 Gex turned bubblegum bass into its own version of like it, that it became hyper pop, like you know, like where My, PC uh, music and bubblegum bass became an even different sound, you know? Like, this is like the I love this. The top review for this album on Rate Your Music tells me all I need to know about it, which is. This is what you get when you travel back to 2005 to give Sean Bonnet estrogen, Adderall, and a door. I mean, that's the thing about, like, a lot of these albums from, like, last year and 2020. Like, I'll say, like, the indie, the indie trans woman music scene is, like, amazing lately. Like, this album, Black Dresses, and, like... There's there's a lot backwash. of interesting stuff coming. Ethel Kane. Yeah, backwash. Yeah, weather weather day is not a trans woman, but they're androgynous and they don't identify with any gender specifically. So I will count them as a trans musician. Stuff like that. That's like uh, home is where um, Glass Beach. Stuff like that. Like there's a scene of like people because that like are mixing all this stuff together and none of it sounds sloppy and it's starting to become a thing where people find it and they find it originally is mostly found in queer circles then people mock it then all of a sudden someone who isn't as immature as a rate your music user even if these aren't the hot even if that isn't the highest praise uh anthony fantano or like a pitchfork will highlight these artists and then they start getting like actual respect like then you start seeing like black dresses i would see like in 2019 like people shitting on them on rate your music because a bunch of queer people like myself are like this is great and then the thing a bunch about, of like that, that people dynamic, wouldn't get it. I'm starting to realize I read an interview on Rate Your Music uh, with uh, the guy who founded Longinus Recordings, which is the label that releases all the music from Paranormal, Asian Glow, and Sonos Tomum Conta. And it was a real insight into the fact that while we have this stereotype, right, of the Rate Your Music user as this like, you know, jaded 4chan esque person who's living in like the 2000s, in more recent years, the dynamic of that website and the demographic of that website has been more and more attuned towards young queer people. And a lot yeah. of these artists that we talk about are getting lifted up because of that website. I feel like the demographic of that website has shifted so dramatically in recent years in such a positive way that is so much more inclusive now, not even just in terms of like sexualities and genders and the kind of artists and, and that are lifted up, but also just the, the genres of music and, and the tastes that are, it's become so much more of an eclectic website and it's heading more and more in that direction, yeah. which is why yeah, I think sure. that it's an interesting like little cultural snapshot. Anyway, moving along, since we are very predictably getting ahead of ourselves and, and rambling, let's get into our first review of the day, which is... The new album from Lizzo, Special. Now, I've been waiting with bated breath ever since I first heard this to talk about this album, because this is... I mean, special is the right word. This album is a treat. This is something that is... An album that comes along, not rarely, I would say, but maybe like seldom enough for it to feel meaningful when it does. And that is an album that is fundamentally, in basically every sense, a complete miscalculation of an artist's strengths. A total, absolute clusterfuck that still somehow remains ridiculously entertaining. Uh, somehow it almost brute forces its way into being a, an enjoyable experience for me despite being as I said a total miscalculation of an artist that, that's a good way of describing it reduction of an artist's persona to the most like cliche aspects of who that artist is and look let me be fair here Lizzo has come up and has based a lot of her music and her persona around very particular aspects of who she is, of projecting ideas of body positivity, of black positivity, and of these very specific forms of empowerment that she is all about and has been all about. And Cause I Love You, the album she put out, her kind of big breakout release, like, is an album that is filled with all of those feelings and is so effusively enjoyable and entertaining um, because of how fully it just believes in that thing and just fully dives so deeply into that aesthetic. Has great production, has a great sense of personality and originality within that world, and just is an album that's impossible, I think, to not just 
even if you don't like it, it's impossible to not respect and it's impossible not to have a smile on your face when you listen to songs like, you know, the title track and Like a Girl, Juice, Soulmate, like so many. Like a Girl is such a fucking banger. God, I fucking love that. Juice is, Juice is rightfully beloved, but I also want to bring up like, I was sure you think Cry Baby went on. As I Mm -hmm. mentioned, like I was listening to it today, actually, because I wanted to re- reintroduce it to myself actually i don't think i ever listened to it in full i think i only listened to part of it and like that opening track hits you immediately on because i love you yeah then you get juice and that's great and then i get to soulmate and jerome and i'm like eh, this feels kind of one note and then the minute you get to cry baby you're like this is vibing but i still might be one note and then you hit tempo and then you're like holy shit she's killing this and then missy elliott like M- missy the elliott, like god missy elliott I need- comes on this song and she just starts making animal noises and it it's is amazing fucking, it's fucking it's amazing. amazing and liz was pulling up her into the deal too fucking ass so fat i need a jack but it never goes flat and you're like whoa <laughs> <laughs> you're like it's not an amazing album it can get a bit too samey at times but uh, i could see why before she got her pop hits later in 2019 like this was the indie record where people are like why is this girl not a pop star and then she became one and then a bunch of people in the indie scene went well now i don't like her anymore well, it's be- the same sort of thing honestly that's the same thing that happened with cardi b because when she first became big mm-hmm. a lot of it was because music press and music publications were like really into what she was doing i remember when i think it was pitchfork named invasion of privacy like the album of the year the year that it came out right she was an artist that had this particular pull for some reason and then i guess as she's gotten bigger and bigger it's not that respect for her has dwindled in critical circles it's just that she's kind of outgrown that and lizzo i think is somewhat similar although fundamentally i don't think quite as savvy as cardi b nor as dynamic i also think that there is certainly an element to it that i think we can all agree which is that a lot of people have been really weird about a black woman like who is on the larger side like being in the spotlight to the point where that is somehow the only thing that many people in the press will talk about Mm -hmm. and it really really ruined a lot of the discussion on it Mm -hmm. because she's a great artist and none of one was really talking about her music when i'll say it those hits back in 2019 were really good too truth hurts is still a great song boys good as hell not as much but still boys is good and i mean well, well here's the if thing. I could segue into this album, like the single for this one that everyone knows, you know, about it's about damn time. damn time, which like, is that let me is just put one this of the best albums, on, one of the best songs on there, in my opinion. It is the best song on here. Let me put this out. Oh, here. yeah. Yeah. This is the leave the yeah. door open of this year. This song is oh, oh, yeah. immaculate. Oh, yeah. It sounds astonishing in terms of how well produced it is. It reminded me of like a Dua Lipa track in terms of just like oh, how what? danceable. <laughs> but I. I love Dua Lipa's great Love Her Last album. This is way better than any song I've heard from her. I absolutely adore this song. Honestly, the thing I'll say about Lizzo that I think she deserves credit for is like, she was one of the first people in that era of like, she came in and then it was like, and then you got The Weeknd with After Hours and Dua Lipa with Future Nostalgia. But she was one of the first people in there that was really pushing this new sound into pop music of just this, fun disco inspired like super energized dance music that brought in modern elements but still kept it fresh and light in an era where things were kind of pop music is not going to be very well remembered for the 2010s but now we because of people people like Lizzo and Dua Lipa and Lil Nas X and people like that like people are going to still come back to the pop records of this era because people like that became big and genuinely did something and and when those that element is on here, like it works really, really well. As I said, like about damn time is great, and the sign is also a great opener. Like it just begins off with that. I keep singing these songs because they keep breaking my heart. I'm like, that's a great opening line. Like, oh yeah, oh literally the the opener. Hello, motherfuckers, and you're like, yes, this is how you should open an album. <laughs> Yes, even if the line about uh, not needing that energy because, bitch, I'm a Tesla is kind of fucking dumb. But this is the thing. Like, it is it's not, it's not a lick of sense. I was hearing people talk about it really confusedly and people 
really turning on Lizzo in some way. And I was like, huh, I wonder what's, and I saw your tweet about it where you're like, it's a mess, but I love it. And I was like, I wonder what my experience with this is going to be. And I get to those first two tracks. I'm like, this is really good. And then Girls happens and it's really weird. (laughs) And honestly sounds kind of, there's something about taking the most, one of the most misogynistic and honestly worst Beastie Boys songs ever written and then trying to turn it into this like girl power anthem except for the fact that that song was already awful from the basis because the instrumental wasn't good either which i say as a huge beastie boys fan that is definitely the weakest instrumental on ill communication it's on but, license to ill license um, to ill sorry yeah but yeah i know but agree. yeah it, it's a very weird track because you're just sitting here and you're like this is an interesting idea, but boy, is it, does it feel like someone like trying to do a twist and then just face planting in the water instead? Like it is one of those. And it's kind of like that for a bit, like special, the title track. I'm not going to lie. It sounds like commercial music in a lot of ways. Oh, and that's the thing she said, you know, you can't buy this from the store. In a lot of ways, yes. You definitely can. You definitely can, Miss Lizzo. Here's the thing, all right? So I need to get a few things off my chest because I've been building up this album inside of me all week. Uh, I kind of already sort of introduced my feelings when I said, like, this is a complete train wreck. And I'm not, like, going to hedge that. I think this is an absolute mess. And I've listened to it eight times this week (laughs) and I can understand if it just goes through someone's earring out the other I'm not going to say like you know if you don't agree with what I my perspective then you're missing whatever but I just find this thing fucking it's such a strange experience to listen to it is Lizzo leaning into these aspects of her persona that she has kind of outlined in her previous music and leaning into them so hard that they become these weird contorted stereotypes and yeah the thing is there's certainly not going to be a lizzie borden or water me on this one like there's not going to be any of her heavy rap material or anything for sure and she's definitely moved away from that um lizzo said in an interview behind this record that she wrote 200 songs for this album and this is 200 fucking what the what in the rivers Cuomo making blue are you <laughs> now look Jesus and you, you know what the sound this really does sound like a 200 song album that then she went to the studio and said which one of these is best for me like instead of it being like I look, picked the best of them you know <laughs> here's the thing about that is bullshit <laughs> no <laughs> look, 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 look. the thing the, the the impression i get from lizzo as much affection that as i have for her it comes back to that thing uh where i sort of think of her alongside an artist like cardi b or even megan Thee stallion where there's this some level of like critical respect that kind of pushes them into the limelight in tandem with you know a general audience commercial viability and attachment that's happening and all these sorts of things are kind of But the thing about Lizzo is that her artistry aside, she just doesn't quite have that same level of pull and that same level of connection. And I think even with a song like About That Time, that's almost a song that you feel like is appealing more to like the older audience. So like maybe like, you know, mums and stuff like this sort of, it's almost like a sophisticated pop version of what the kind of like trap pop stuff that, uh, you know, Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion are doing. But I think that Lizzo is quite keen on having hits and quite keen on appealing to this wide audience. I think she is attracting an audience of older, you know, maybe older millennials, maybe even some Gen X people. And she really wants to appeal to the youth as well. She wants to be able to cover that demographic. And as a result of that, I think that she has, to some extent, dulled some of the finer edges of her personality and is kind of designing a record that feels very much tiktok ready and a lot of artists are doing that now i mean about that time is literally a tiktok trend yeah well and i don't disrespect that 
and it doesn't mean that the songs can't be good. Obviously, I've said already about Damn, Damn Time, I think is a great song. But there's a certain extent to which I feel the edges of Lizzo or some of the kind of wrinkles and maybe even some of the originality in what she does is a little bit lacking here. And some of the music has this there isn't a tempo. template. That said, the production is mostly excellent. There is still this level of like detail and care put into these songs where they have elements like the guitar solo that comes in on Everybody's Gay. And obviously the presence of Lizzo's flute, oh, I which is one of her, that. Lizzo's flute talents is one of her most like iconic aspects. It's mostly, I wish it were more present on this record like it was on Cause I Love You, but it does show up on About That Time. And you do get those flavors of Lizzo that come through, but they're fewer and further between. And also I think, in chasing that idea of wanting to create music that just kind of sticks out and maybe even can be memeified, you get what are some of the most baffling artistic decisions I've seen an artist like Lizzo make in a long time. And I look, I have like nothing. Birthday but, girl. I, that's one example. Yes. I have nothing but respect for a song like I Love You Bitch, for instance. Ooh, that said, that's another one of them. That said, I would be lying if I didn't say that the only response I have to the song is to fucking laugh my ass off the entire time and listen to it. The way that she leans uh, into that, I love you, bitch. And she just goes over and I, it's absolutely hilarious. Girls is kind of funny in the same way, even if it is on all levels, aesthetically an utter fucking nightmare to listen to. Oh, it is. It, it is. It is a nightmare. It's dreadful. Like, that's the it, thing. It's the that's the only track on there that I could genuinely say like this sounds bad. The rest of them, their biggest problem is the sounds like a white painted wall is the other bad songs. Uh, <laughs> the part where she's just like, hold my bag, bitch. Hold she my just, bag, bitch. The part where she just like stops saying words and just starts like stumbling over sounds. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was wondering about that. I was like, this isn't even to the beat. It doesn't make any sense. That's my girl. We CEOs and we dancing like a CEO. Lizzo, I don't know if you're up with the discourse right now, but we're actually fuck CEOs right now. So maybe that's not the best. Yeah, even I already <laughs> stopped with that just stuff. Like, like there, I love that there was um there was discourse around the original version of the single because she used the word spaz in it, which is not a word that is uh necessarily like looked upon very favorably now and it, so it's she, not a go she re i mean it's, it's, a, it's a common word in in a lot of hip-hop songs in the past era but it's yeah it's age what's poorly funny i mean to me, what's funny to me is that she re-released the song removing that but and look I'm, I'm saying this i'm not offended by this personally like it doesn't affect me <laughs> i just find this funny is that she re-released the song without that but she still includes the line i'm a go lorena bobbit on him so he never fuck again regardless of the the finer details of the situation it's based on it's a very trivial way of referencing it and it kind of reduces it a little bit to a, a punchline look which again yeah I'm not it reminds me of why the coverage of it i'm not offended yeah. by it but i just find it to be funny and i actually like i find it kind of endearing when lizzo makes these kind of very poor uh decisions that she immediately has to backtrack on because no one's like quality control checking i like how kind of just bad at this Lizzo is in a weird way um I mean she definitely reads as someone who is used to being like someone who is trying to get up there yeah I mean, now that she's and up she there like she's that. not used to every single I being so she wants that LGBTQ cred that artists like Lady Gaga and Charlie XCX have she wants it so bad yeah and that's one of the yeah, most prevailing yeah. themes of this record uh, and yet she released Everybody is Gay, which I got to say, already its title annoyed me. And once I got to the chorus, I went, are you little fucking B? You're still <laughs> making the get it gay, but it means happy kind of joke. Where you're so, like, look, the song goes hard. So instrumentally, but look, I want to zero in on one of my favorite songs on this record, which I like because I think the effort is so strong, but is also like revealing of some of the biggest flaws of this record, which is how badly Lizzo wants to be accepted by, say, the queer community, by the TikTok community, by all of these things. It's the song To Be Loved, parentheses, Am I Ready, which is a banger, has an absolute... <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that's yeah. one of the ones I'm weaker on. 
well, and I can understand why. Banger song, in my opinion, killer key change towards the end of it. This is a Chromatica song. This is Lady Gaga. This is just straight off of Lady Gaga's Chromatica. The way Lizzo sings on this sounds like Lady Gaga on Chromatica. The whole beat and sound and production of it is straight off of Lady Gaga's Chromatica. This is her so desperately trying to have a rain on me, right? And and it's so funny because every it's time not as good as rain on that me. That is so bluntly what she's trying to do to the point where I swear to God, she sounds exactly like Lady Gaga when she's singing the Am I ready to be loved? She does that same intonation. And it's so funny. Three, this is one of those tracks that really embody to me that idea that I said where it's like either something where Lizzo shines through and I don't get why people are so harsh on her or the most generic thing that I could imagine <laughs> Lizzo making where she makes something that sounds like it could fit into a commercial, which is ironic because I got first introduced to Lizzo from commercials where her song Water Me was used in a direct TV ad. And I went, this song slaps. I need to find out more. And uh, Boots Riley used Lizzie Borden for one of the Sorry to Bother You trailers. And I was like, and so I got introduced to her. And ironically, now I listen to this and I go, oh, that was Lizzo? Like that, when I heard special, I didn't even think for a second. I wasn't like, that's Lizzo. Our reaction was, yeah, that fits for an Amazon music ad. Like, <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, you and I have gone off and off already, but I want to hear a bit more from Jake because I know Jake yeah, has had I a apologize. similarly entertaining experience with this record okay. this week. And I'd love to hear, Jake, like what, what your feeling is like when you listen to this and how you would describe your opinion overall on this thing. All right. My, my opinion is not a million miles away from you. In fact, I would say my opinion is exactly where yours is. I, I have probably the most affinity for this record of anybody here. Uh, not that it's again, like, and, and that I say I like this album. And here's, here's what I'm going to say. I'm just going to say this. I don't dislike any song on this album. Not a one of them. Wow. All of them, I think, sound, with the exception of girls, sound largely <laughs> yeah, i think we can all be in agreement on that one <laughs> yeah but see, that's the thing though is that girls while being the exception is like i mean i hate to sort of it's like the overplay one that this is quality. the biggest risk and you have to kind of respect well, it away it's a risk and it's it is just hysterical like i mean it as just an event on this album that happens it's less enjoyable as a song and more as a literal 121 second long like comedy sketch it is and a it's, it's funny tastelessness and that is yeah, what makes it yes. so, so enjoyable it, it's it is a fun time I don't think that there's anything on here that that's that's what I think I come down on in terms of being more positive is that everything on here is so like cornball like unfat like it, it it is so fundamentally uncool and it doesn't care and I think when you said that it's like that nobody like course corrected her or stopped her from doing any of these like like blunders that she has throughout this album. And I think that's what's refreshing about Lizzo. Like I, she is far from my favorite pop star, but in terms of like voices in the world of pop music, and especially on Cause I Love You, which I adore that album. I think that's a great pop record. I listened to that endlessly that year. I think that the title track on that album is like one of the best vocal performances on a pop song that has ever been laid to tape, frankly. Uh, I Love You and, was definitely one with uh, the Billie Eilish album that was released that year where you went, if this is where pop yeah. music is going, I'm okay with it because this is, these are both and really interesting. <laughs> I listened to both of those and enjoyed them both in the exact same way and that like from a substance point of view, they were these artists that were portraying these things that were fundamentally uncool and unhip in a way that was cool and was hip with a sound that was interesting and cutting edge. You had that production from people like Phineas on the Billy album, and that was what made that appealing to people. But Billy as an artist is voicing these very teenage girl opinions and these teenage girl issues and these very teenage girls perspectives on these issues. And they're not necessarily nuanced or, or, or anything. And Lizzo's the same way. She's very like 
pop feminism girl power. And it's not like, it, oh, you know, yeah. she's not trying to be deep. And that's fine for the record, but she's coming at this in a way where it's all about the sound and the confidence and the bombasticity of what she's doing. She's getting Missy Elliott on here and she's just, she's being a fundamentally ridiculous artist. And actually album, that's something I didn't realize. There's no features on this one either. Yeah, and I think that speaks to maybe the biggest problem of the album is that it just kind of, generally speaking, does feel sounds very similar. Like the it sounds similar. There's nothing being like pushed here for Lizzo in a way that it felt like you know, "Cause I Love You" was not a revolutionary sound, but it was something that you know the year it came out, it sounded fresh. Like there was nothing else out that year that sounded no. like that. And yeah. so you have this, and it's like. It's, it feels like she's trying to sort of cement her identity as, you know, the person that she is. And she's being this uncool person who's talking, who's making songs like Girls and I Love You Bitch. They're just so like, they're like dichotomously wholesome and like also kind of stupid. And it, it, it results in a, very, very specific kind of likability that I don't expect everyone else to get on with, but that to me make every song on here compelling in one way or another, mainly because it's a combination of the fact that you can only be so bad of a song when Lizzo is singing it. She's a great yeah. singer and she doesn't deliver any bad performances on here. I wish she maybe did more of her rapping, which she is a great rapper. I, I kind of wish- I, that I, that I keep was, bringing up Lizzie Borden because that track is great. It's a great example of how good of a rapper she is. And oh, I, yeah. I just wish that that dynamism maybe was added to her sound. And, you know, that's cool. But there's songs out here that are just so eminently danceable. There's shit like Everybody's Gay, which is so much fun. There's shit like Naked, which, again, displays that I kind naked. of brazen confidence. And there are songs like Coldplay and shit that are just so, again, you like, what other artist is going to make a song their closing track where they literally talk about being sad and listening to one of the most, one of modern music's most uncool pop bands. Like th this is just not, like the sampling of Coldplay's The Scientist is very well done in my opinion. I like it. I'm not like a big Coldplay person. So if this like, you know, offends other people then like, I don't know, missed me. But the thing is, is that Lizzo here is at her most, one dimensional but that one dimensionality is so big and so entertaining and so fun and it's here for 35 minutes so it's hard to argue with the fact that it's like there's a lot of different kinds of sounds on here there's the more upbeat ones there's the like she has a couple of the slower jams so I'm trying, like, I'm being very effusive in my praise here, but this is like the most effusive mid record ever. I feel like I'm, I'm Riley this... talking about Charlie XCX's Crash, which is an album that I honestly feel like is very similar yeah, to this I one. Yeah, I feel very the, similar all of its about ideas. Album. I like Crash. All a bit of more their, yeah. I'd see, I like this one more just because I think Crash and Charlie are, have artist sensibilities that are more geared towards you and Lizzo is more geared towards me. And I feel like these albums both represent these artists sort of exercising a one dimensionality to their sound that is fundamentally appealing to the people who like them, but also is kind of a creative dead end for both of them and just sort of feels like variations on a theme of what they've done. So it's like, it's, it's good and it's enjoyable, but at the same time, it's very much a, a bag of half realized shit. And you don't really like, it, 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 like I really have fun with this album but aside from the fact that I had to review this record and thus listen to it to further understand it if I listen to a Lizzo album there's there's no way in hell I'm picking because I love you or not picking because I love you over this just because that is an empirically better album she needs to be more adventurous and more creative yeah. and you know just try to flesh herself out more but at the same time I feel like this is still a sort of like there's a there's a core here that I feel is certainly undeniable that is emblematic of Lizzo's appeal in the current world of pop music.
let's move on to our favorite tracks and ratings then and we can uh, wrap this puppy up uh emily why don't you go first this time what were your three favorite tracks least favorite track and a rating out of 10 my favorite tracks were uh about damn time the sign uh cold play and my least favorite track was girls and my rating out of 10 is a six out of 10. I think it is, it shines occasionally, it is generic occasionally. I don't hate it, I don't love it. It is, but I wouldn't say it's mediocre either. It's in the middle, it's okay. Alrighty, um, I'll go next. My three favorite songs are About Damn Time, uh, Everybody's Gay, and I'll say Am I Ready to Be Loved, or To Be Loved, Am I Ready? fucking jesus least favorite track is girls and uh i'm going to give it a as positive as a 5.5 out of 10 can possibly be uh this is what i was close to giving it a five as well but i i landed it's it's right there on the threshold of a five and a half and a six morgan uh yeah favorite tracks about damn time everyone's gay and this the the uh the m night Shyamalan sign question mark <laughs> i want to hear uh lizzo do everybody's gay pejorative <laughs> <laughs> parenthetical i want lizzo to just <laughs> do a really homophobic song <laughs> i just want to will that into existence <laughs> You ever just like, like, yeah, you ever just sitting around and you're just like, what, wh- why do I have an opinion on this thing? Everything, everything I know times. about this has been against my will. Um, yeah, least favorite is gir- gir- girls, girls, and uh, gir- I, don't, I don't know, five out of ten, who cares? <laughs> Three favorite tracks about damn time everybody's gay great theme song for this podcast and um i guess i like naked i think that's a pretty sweet song uh and i'll say my least favorite track uh you know what i'm actually gonna say uh birthday girl just because girls is so funny i just don't like i i don't even want it off the album at this point i i look forward to it uh and yeah i i will co-sign that emily's take, <laughs> it feels like it's your turn like my parties. swag on it feels uh it feels like spirit halloween lizzo uh and uh i I'd, I'd give the album a light but still somewhat enthusiastic six uh i i enjoy it i can't lie no shame in that and i will be editing my digital version of license to ill to replace girls with girls don't doubt it for a second anyway moving on then to our final review of the day the brand new album from black midi hellfire now emily you and i have basically dominated the first half of the lizard discussion so what i would like yeah. to do here is i want to hear from jake and morgan first on this record like what your expectations were and what your experience has been like with this album especially compared to cavalcade which we did review just about one year ago how do you feel this one holds up and what do you think of the way that the black midi boys have kind of continued to push their sound well uh while uh, i think that the unanimous feelings on cavalcade as a whole among this podcast i mean obviously it made it onto our uh like best songs of the year list with uh, john 50 uh that was just you know it was a very positive review i didn't really speak on that album uh and my opinions on black mini in general have just never been disclosed and I will admit, you know, I'm notoriously the person who like, you know, I didn't like the the new the newest Black Country New Road album because I was held at a distance and I just sort of have expressed my feelings on the whole windmill scene, new British art punk wave. And like last week with the Viagra Boys thing, I talked about that and how some of the albums I think are I really enjoy. Some of them I just think are fine and some of them I just don't get at all. 
So Black Midi, admittedly on that sort of spectrum, have always veered more towards positive. Like I remember, I remember the exact like day that I listened to Schlagenheim after it got a lot of buzz and I listened to it and I was like, I mean, this is cool, but like, okay. Like I, I, I appreciated what they were doing and how different it was and how singular of a voice they were right now. But it was just one of those albums that you listen to and it's like, yeah, everything here is good. I, I just, I don't have any feelings beyond that. It doesn't really make me feel much. And then after that, you had Cavalcade, which everybody freaked out about even more. And so I was, I approached that super apprehensively just because that whole, you know, the whole wave had a lot of hype behind it. And now you have this and it's like even bigger. And I listened to it and I was like, okay, I can get on board with this. This, th I, this appeals to my sensibilities a little bit more. And I feel like I understood the kind of band that Black Midi wanted to be more on Cavalcade because Schlagenheim, if like my biggest complaint with it is that it feels a bit mon like not really monotonous, but I guess homogenous is that it all just kind of feels like it, 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 it's like the core of an interesting idea and sound and nothing but the core. And it feels like Cavalcade was the first, you know, foray into diving what they were interested in as artists deeper. And granted, I still wasn't as hot on that album as everybody else here. I still kind of appreciated it with a distance. It's like, yeah, all the songs here are good, cool, fun. A lot of them are really well written. I, I did not think it came together as an album. I liked each individual song, but like as a cohesive experience, I was like, this feels a little slapdash to me, frankly, even though I don't ever not enjoy the album. And I just feel like, okay, this is still headed in the right direction. This kind of weird sort of post-punk infusion of like King Crimson, but also like, you know, a lot of post-punk bands with like a more modern kind of witty satirical writing that again, I always have mentioned that that's not always something I get along with, but what Black Midi do with it is interesting. The, the characters and stories that they tell uh, are always fascinating. You don't get anybody who has a voice quite like they do, both sonically and like artistically. So going into Hellfire and it was rinse repeat with everything again. It was like albums coming out, everybody freaks out about the singles, immense hype about everything. It officially comes out, everybody's losing their mind. But I may have listened to this a little bit before its technical release, so I had a longer time to form my opinion. But I can safely say that I have finally fully arrived on the, the Black Midi train and that I, I get it. And actually, simultaneously, while I do think that I'm finally with this band, I also do think that Hellfire is the most successful distillation of what they've been doing and what they've been trying to accomplish with their music. I, I do think that there is a certain sort of limit with my enjoyment of them so far up until this point. But I also just think that Hellfire is just the best incarnation of the band. And a lot of it just has to do with the fact that the music here feels so brash and confident and it feels like you know this kind of fun jazz rock kind of stuff is that this is you know the best John Zorn album released in some time it sounds exactly like that kind of brutal prog really really eccentric jazz shit that we have all expressed a lot of love for in the past and half of it is kind of like this band just beating you into submission with how good they are at like playing their instruments like I'm, I'm not going to say anything anyone hasn't said before with in terms of like these bandmates and how like talented they are but the drumming on this and the fills and like they are so ridiculously lightning fast they would make fucking Elvin Jones blush like there are moments on here especially like on the front half I find so much of this shit so impressive and the the absolute like race of horns that are all across here that like, I think that one of my favorite moments of music all year so far has been on the track. Uh, is it Welcome to Hell that has those really gigantic builds with like the horns that are really like triumphant sounding? That's, 
whenever it like builds to that, that is absolutely sublime. And this album too feels a little bit more cohesive than Cavalcade did for me. That was an album that felt like every song was a distinct idea and had its own identity, but they didn't really stitch together. This on the other hand, it feels like one big, almost 40 minute long song. And that is dope as fuck, honestly. Like it separates itself, I think into two pretty distinct halves, but those distinct halves are like some of the most exciting music that I've heard all year. And they're all layered with these diverse stories and stuff. Like you have Dangerous Liaisons, which is a story about like a guy hiring a farmhand to murder somebody. And then in the end, when he's reading the newspaper about the report of the dead body, Satan jumps out and sends him to hell. And it's like, okay, like this kind of focus on tragic figures like they were uh, sort of focused on with Cavalcade is kind of also here. There's a lot of stuff that feels very pertinent and modern. A lot of stuff about like people who are going to the military. That was one of the lines that really stood out to me is it's just like to die for your country. That's not, uh, not how you win a war. To kill for your country is how you win a war. That kind of shit is so acerbic and so like funny. There are moments on here where like the finale of this 27 questions has like this insanely opulent theatrical, like it, it feels like a legitimate stage performance is happening in front of you. And it sort of ties all the themes of the album together. And there's like one part in one of the songs where they talk about uh, a brothel and uh, talking about how like they say that the prostitutes are destined for hell, but also uh, do you see any Christians being on their knees as much as they do? And it's just like this kind of really immediately funny shit is so raucously entertaining that it just kind of goes with Black Midi's everything in the kitchen thing, sink aesthetic. Their album covers to me are so indicative of their identity. They're just a mess of color and goop and just shit all over the place and it's like this is what listening to this band actually feels like it is they're almost a band that I, this is going to sound like diminishing and i don't mean it to but at least with me black mini don't even really feel like an uh, a band that are going to produce an a game changer of an album any point in their career they're just going to keep doing this unique singular thing and make the variety in and of itself with the, like, they're just going to invent themselves in a slightly new way. And if that's all they end up doing for the rest of their career, I'm okay with it because they're so good at it now that I, I just, I, they have willed me into submission with this one. Cavalcade might be an album that contains a little bit more restraint in some moments and it like holds itself back, but I love Hellfire a lot more because it has no limitations. It is simply an, acerbic beatdown of a record that is just so much fun. It prioritizes fun over anything else. And that's why I get along with something like this and not say the Viagra Boys album that we talked about is that that felt plotting and monotonous and witless and there was just no dynamism to it. Whereas this is just nothing but fluid Hellfire is a perfect name for this entire experience. There's just so many moments like the fucking drum fills that are enormous on Eat Men Eat, the absolute blitzkrieg of Sugar Zoo, which I love the part where at the beginning, it's like a boxing match and it's like, let's get ready to rumble. And then they immediately come in and sound like a lounge jazz band. It's like, a, it's just an immediate joke that you just, you're on board for. And it's a really rewarding album just because it does have a lot of storytelling and a lot to say with its lyricism that I'm sure you all are get more into. But this has been a very fun, very interesting record. And I finally feel like all of the things that people found appealing about previous Black Midi albums are now finally making themselves aware to me. So that was really satisfying to finally kind of understand all of this and even kind of like empathize with it. I still think it's a bit there's still not a lot of this that I get beyond like my pure raw musical nerd appreciation. Like, you know, this album doesn't exactly steal my heart or anything, 
but it's still such a fun time when it's on. Like you don't have to be a great album or great art doesn't always have to like move you or affect you that profoundly emotionally. But this is still something that does feel like a, a large scale stage production that is just filled with so much individuality. You can tell that Black Midi are an assembly of really singular voices that all manage to make themselves known. There's nobody here that feels like they are put in the background. Every single bandmate offers up something that feels organic and tangible about this instrumentation. But at the same time, it's not really comparable to anything else directly. Like you can't just get this from a Zorn album and you can't just get this from like an early King Crimson album. So I, I think this is Black Mini's best album yet uh, at risk of sounding like a hyperbolic fanboy, but I'm not a fanboy of this band. I've, I, I've struggled with them, but I do think that this is a benchmark that is worth noting for music this year. Uh, it, it's a terrific record. Nothing but good things to say, really. Morgan, what are your thoughts? Um, hmm. it's hard to tell if it just really hasn't hit for me yet, but I do find myself preferring Cavalcade just by a small margin. For instance, this record doesn't have an ascending fourth, uh, for me, uh, nothing at quite that high of quality, uh, but it is all very cohesive and all very entertaining. I'm not sure how much of a progression it is i can't i i have to say i was kind of expecting a like schlagenheim to cavalcade level leap in musical maturity and i didn't you know this is not really that which is fine seems more to me like a a broadening of what this band can do instead of a progression and and you know that's cool all of the things that are great about Cavalcade are pretty much great about this album in slightly different ways. Maybe I've not seen The Matrix yet, but uh, my, my hype is somewhat mild compared to, you know, the rest of the internet. Although I will say, I, I, will, I will firmly plant my flag in saying that we may be hyping this band up a little too much purely because they're only going to make better albums from this point forward like this is yeah. so clearly a band on an upward trajectory i think unless they completely blow it like in the next two or three albums which i guess is possible but seems unlikely at this point that i think an album like this is going to seem like you know they're live by night when their <laughs> farewell to kings or hemispheres is still on the way see like i thought i'd agree with that the i think i can kind of draw jake and morgan i think you can kind of like meet your two perspectives in the middle somewhere even if i'm probably a bit closer to jake i think this is a fantastic record but um i keep thinking about while listening to it I mean, the biggest comparison point that comes to mind i mean obviously people bring up bands like primus and king crimson stuff i thought of mr oh, yeah. bungle a lot and I, oh, yeah. the thing is, like, Mr. Bungle had this three album streak right there self titled Disco Volante and California. And their self title was the, the most messy, formless, just complete, absolute sh shit show of a record. It was very entertaining, and we did a very fun record club on it. Disco Volante was not exactly much more honed in, it was, it had some more sort of song like structures to it um but it's kind of like the ugly sort of middle child of their um discography in terms of being less you know remarkable or less like acclaimed and i think that's where cavalcade sits as well even if that's still my favorite black midi record i feel like it, people talk about it now less than the two records on either side of it and then california is like the masterpiece it's the refinement it is taking all the craziness and figuring out how to structure it into these very compact and tightly wound songs that are affecting and memorable and not just about throwing as much sound at you as possible. And in some ways, this is, in some ways thematically, this is like their California because for both bands, 
this is the most, I would say, conceptually unified and thematically consistent record where you have a basis yeah. for what all of the songs are about. They share a clear theme that's not hard to unpack and they're all variations on that theme thematically. The difference is that while I think that Geordie Greep's writing and just general construction of songs and stories and all that sort of thing is better than it ever has been before, the music is certainly not worse, but the music is just far more, I guess, difficult to comprehend and kind of just overwhelming in a way that at times, if you're not in the mood for it, those two aspects can kind of clash against each other. That said, I think that the intensity and just the violence of the way that the sound, the brutality of it is well fitting to the thematic subject matter. This is a set of songs about characters who are destined to go to hell, essentially characters who are, you know, on some level fundamentally have these nefarious intentions and are exploiting other people and are acting in selfish ways and are essentially destined to meet their doom or to come upon some realization of the error of their ways when it is too late to change. Jake's already outlined some of the characters and some of the stories that pop up in here. There are even recurring characters. I think there is one character called Tristan Bongo, who's a character that shows up in, I think it is... Uh, welcome to hell or it might be I mean, it yeah it's be welcome to hell anyway as this kind of like innocent figure and he's essentially in welcome, uh, he's at the get the races began yeah yeah he's this innocent figure essentially who is besieged upon by the military industrial complex and in welcome to hell and then essentially becomes embroiled in the world of horse racing essentially in uh the race is about to begin which is i guess a metaphor for addiction and like falling upon uh vices as crutches essentially and kind of downward spiraling and you have i also think there's something about war in there as well yeah too. absolutely there's, that is there, a very there, there, i mean the idea of the someone won someone lost i don't know yeah. i'm still here like absolutely I listen to that i'm like is yeah. that basically just the iraq war yeah <laughs> Yeah, and um, they're topical frequently on this album. There's also an allusion to a disease from the East on one of these songs that I think is probably kind of a cheeky nod at COVID, perhaps. <laughs> You're at least the way that it is um, conceptualized and talked about in Western spaces. But yeah, there's yes. like one other thing I'll say as well. There's an increased presence, as there has been on every record, but more so here of Cameron Picton, the band's bassist, I think or maybe one of their guitarists. I'm not, he's a very like much a wizard sort of uh, instrumental virtuoso who has sung on previous songs, has a more restrained and I would say emotive voice than Geordie Greep, sings here on songs like Still, which is actually my favorite song on this record. I've come to have a real affection that. for it. And part of it is because it sounds so unlike any other black MIDI song. And it's such a welcome like mm -hmm. break from the chaos and has such tasteful instrumentation and comparatively restrained and emotive lyricism that um, especially in lines like, if I ever needed love, it's now just take me thinking stupid. I know it's late, but please stay up and talk to me. Uh, accept some kind of old defeat i know a song that gives everything that you need like there, there is a real tenderness to this that i think comes at exactly the right time and that's one of the great successes of this record is i think there's a lot of good counterpoint in it when it gets particularly overwhelming and one of the things i don't so much love about the way this band are talked about uh, by some of the of, of their younger fans i suppose is that there's this hunger for them to just be as crazy as possible and to a certain extent, that closes off, I think, some of the appreciation of when this band actually showcase restraint and showcase uh, tastefulness in their songwriting. I mean, this for me is the reason why Still and songs like Dangerous Liaisons are some of the biggest standouts to me, because they showcase, I think, uh, the band proving that they don't necessarily have to rely so much on that maximalist, intense, maximum beats per minute style of prog that you get on most of this record uh that said when they do do that they do it bloody well sugar sue which is uh one of the most hyped up songs ever since they played it live last year is an amazing piece mm -hmm. of jazz fusion that starts the way that jake described and then kind of moves into this philip glass-esque arpeggio section yeah it's just so fucking sick like it's this jazz fusion philip glass type shit and it's like telling the story of this box of this boxing match essentially these figures who are uh, representative of these i guess different aspects of sort of class or upbringing or some kind of i mean one is sugar one is sun Tzu. Yeah. like I, I i thought it was a pretty 
you can say think of like oh war versus kindness yeah <laughs> and the one who represents kindness gets shot in the back by someone outside of the crowd yeah and it's like well the crowd has made its choice yeah and you have like ridiculously you have these simple parables right of these quite simplistic things as you said but they're they're dressed up and they're given so much color and character by how convoluted they are eat men eat i think is a great example again another song that's fundamentally about eat men eat it's another song that's men, fundamentally eat. about greed and uh, consumerism and even the military industrial complex again to a certain extent with some of the military there's a lot about war on song. this record for sure and, <laughs> and yet it, it manifests all of this in the context of a song about this nefarious cat who is feeding on the stomach acid of the uh i guess company men that he essentially gorges and force feeds to death basically and there's um yeah it, 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 it's this ridiculous story that communicates something fundamentally simple there's even a layer of commentary on uh homophobia in the song as well because cameron picked in as gay and the song's characters central characters appear to be gay as well there is a lot happening here it's so full of just stuff to take in it is one of the wildest songs instrumentally as well and yeah i mean emily we had you on for the first time last year to talk about cavalcade you were absolutely over the moon with that record how do you think this one holds up and what are some of your main takeaways from hellfire I mean, since I heard Schlangenheim back in 2019, like I knew this band was something special. Like I pinned them as like, this is going to probably be one of my favorite new bands. Like, cause I just, I feel like we talk a lot about, because there's now this third album, we don't talk enough about Schlangenheim. Schlangenheim is not like a basic record. It's their most post-hardcore influence for sure. Like it's the most heavy. Got a little bit of at the drive-in in there. Yeah, but there's like, there's still a lot of great stuff on there, like Duster and Deer De- near Detroit, Michigan is like amazing. And then you have Cavalcade, which I, that was my album of the year last year. I gave it a 10 out of 10. I haven't given an album a 10 out of 10 since though. We do all, we, we see this new record come out and I hear people saying it's their best one yet. It's their best one yet. And I listen to it and it's really good. It's, I don't think they put out a record that's been, anything less than excellent it's certainly their wildest i think we mentioned like this is they've been turning the crazyometer up with each record for sure and this is certainly their most off the wall gonzo shit yet you know like this is like i thought hogwash and balderdash was wild on cal okay this is this is basically making that look like kenny g you know <laughs> who we will be talking about next week when we review the new imperial triumphant album which he is on oh my god that's that's amazing but if if you like this album and jazz rock boy do i have good news for you about the new imperial triumphant album it is yes this that more (laughs) jazz this album is uh pretty wild to the t but it's i'm not sure if i'd say it's a step four but it's so definitely a new direction and it shows this band is keep inventing keeps inventing itself and keeps trying to find new ways and that's part of why i love it so much and i i you made a great point like still is one of the most fascinating songs on the album for me because it's rare that they allow themselves to go slow uh, on this record and that's uh, the thing slow. like there isn't <laughs> yeah uh, the- this is their first explicitly whole album is themed specifically like like there was a lot of arcs on cavalcade but i wouldn't say that every song's topic connected as evenly as this one does like as you mentioned everyone's going to hell on this album and a lot of it is focusing on systems that cause that war more comes up a lot in fact i'd argue war is the most common way it forms on here in sugar zoo Welcome to Hell, the race is about to begin. Dangerous Liaisons is, you know, contract killing. There, It's basically this soup of like, and it's never just like, these people are evil. It's these people were sucked in by even worse people into doing terrible things. Mm-hmm. Like Dangerous Liaisons is about someone who is not in the contract killing business having to kill someone. You know, Welcome to Hell is about someone who is poached out of the world. Yeah. 
and is now in the middle of the jungle. It's, uh, like, it's, the, it's the poisoning sugar, of evil, essentially. Like the, yeah, the sh- sugar of- zoo is like the attempt to conquer evil, and then the crowd comes back and says, "No, we like the evil more than you." And it's really interesting to see, like, you know, you get to twenty-seven questions, and it's the funeral, and it's the idea of like. Yeah. This is the and this is the man who is like sitting there being like, "This was my life. Why did it end this way? I know I'm going to hell and I'm not happy, but I need to ask these questions." And then it doesn't even get to finish the questions. So he's like, "That's not quite 27, but I feel my heart going." And yeah. you're like, "It's like this amazing way to end the album of albums themes." That being said, I think the thing that makes me say that it's not as good as Cavalcade to me is that the music definitely it is definitely gonzo but i also feel like it needs that loud loud soft loud soft dynamic that they were always good at on schlangenheim and cavalcade to reach that peak that i see people say where they say it's better than cavalcade for and- me this is this is more of cavalcade but a lot weirder and a lot less trim to its most punchy you know it is certainly their most sprawled out that well, I this think is the thing. Like, I want them to get even more sprawling. I want them to make that double record. And I want them to be able oh, to yeah. showcase more of that diversity, more of that sort of softer side, That's be able thing. to really flesh it out. Uh, but the thing is, like, on the note of 27 questions, which I'm glad you mentioned, because it is, I think, their best closer yet. Although Ascending Forth is a fantastic song. Uh, I, it's, it's hard for me to comp, turn against Ascending Forth and Duster. It's not about competition here. It's just about the fact that this brings such a def- def- decisive not only a decisive end to the record which ascending forth absolutely does for cavalcade but also brings the whole thing full circle in a way that's so uh satisfying and so rewarding to re-listens of the album like playing it through the way that it does give this definitive full stop on the all of the various different stories that we have heard up to this point it doesn't necessarily reference them directly there's oblique references in some lyrics but ultimately the point is all of these different experiences all of these different scenarios and short stories that we've encountered in these previous songs they all lead to this one ending essentially they all lead to the grave and they all lead to the moment of realizing that you're going to the grave and that you're full of all these regrets and you have essentially lost the battle essentially and whether that's you know because of forces outside of your control or whatever it's that realization that you know the next thing is hellfire the next thing is damnation and you're just sitting there and you're trying to come to terms with that and it's a really potent and powerful ending to the album and i really really appreciate the way that it's staged and the way that it's set up also musically one of the most theatrical and kind of goofy and wild songs that uh, Black Midi have ever created. I think that makes it a fitting finale for an album like this as well. It's a record that every time I find something to critique or to potentially kind of pick at in terms of being like overly excessive or overly kind of whatever, there's another thing that pulls me back and says, well, actually though, it may have this or this and that, but actually like there's so much more refinement of what makes this band great, both in terms of writing and in terms of musical com- composition and all of those sorts of things that I'm won over again. So at the end of the day, I'm firmly pro Hellfire. I don't prefer it to Cavalcade like you, but I do think that it is a promising next step. I don't think it's a regression. I do think that yeah. this band are getting better and better at actually taking all of the maelstrom of noise and musical ideas in their head and figuring out how to kind of piece them together yeah. into something compelling. That's the best way I would put and, it. Um, yeah. And the fact that this could bring Jake onto Team Black Midi is, I mean, frankly, all that I could possibly have asked for from a record like this. I mean, I, I'm still of the opinion. I think this is the most interesting band out there right now for me. Like Certainly, in, opinion, certainly like... in the conversation, if not absolutely there. All right. Let's do our favorite tracks and ratings then for Black Committee's Hellfire. Jake, why don't you hit us off? Very difficult just because a lot of good songs and they all feel really cohesive, but favorite moments. Sugar Zoo, terrific. Welcome to Hell, probably my favorite on here, probably my favorite Black Midi song in general. And yeah, 27 Questions is such a fucking phenomenal closer. Love how fucking big that song is. And you know, I, uh, 
far from what I would consider perfect or anything, but I, I'd say I don't really have the least favorite track. Like, the uh, I think the Hellfire intro track is sort of like, if that wasn't its own track, it would just be the build into the second one. So isolating it feels unfair. And the tiny little fucking 26 second song in the middle to transition the into the second half. It's of a the great album, transition. Like, I'll give them that. I was expecting that to turn into I a mean, whole song. Like it, yeah, si- it sets not... up the theme of like the race theme of the song that follows it. So it even worked. if I think saying I'm Radio Rahim was a bit on the nose. <laughs> That's that and, made me and laugh. Hey, look, you could just combine that into the next song and it would still feel the same. And every song on here, I just think is pretty great. I don't really have a least favorite track. And I would give this a very, very enthusiastic 8.5. This is a terrific album. I mean, I will also say it's very fitting to lead into a track as wild as and the race is about to begin with, you've never heard something like this before. And it's like, you're right. I haven't ain't lying. because the song is like it's on crack so you ain't seen <laughs> nothing Run. yet yeah three favorites 27 questions in keeping with the best song on the album by black midi is the closer My favorite and... track on the album is 21 questions by 50 cent oh no uh-huh. no uh, the race is about to begin and welcome to hail which I read every single time in the voice of Ian Holm in Ratatouille. When he when <laughs> Luigi walks in, his first official day as chef, and the little, that little man is just standing there, and he goes, welcome to hell. And it's the greatest <laughs> That is not, Jordy Greep could have said that he was my inspiration for my voice, and I'd believe him. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, Least favorite, I will say, uh, probably the defense, but it's good. Most, of the, pretty much everything's good here. Uh, and overall, I will give this a seven and a half. All righty, my three favorite tracks are uh, "Welcome to Hell" still and uh, "Dangerous Liaisons." Although "Sugar Sue" is right up there too. Least favorite is actually, About I think that cruel intentions. <laughs> My least favorite, actually, for as ambitious and far-reaching as it is and just all over the place as it is, I don't really feel that the race is about to begin musically comes together for me as a whole. Uh, and But it's not a bad song. It's just a bit of a mess. I think uh, a lot of cool and interesting and good Chad, musical ideas. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's my least favorite on here. And uh, mine going to give the record a very hearty and deserving 8 out of 10. That would probably be my closest to a negative on here. And even then, that's not much your negative because I really appreciate it. It's just, I will say I listened to it in the car today and I was like, this is not a car driving song for sure. <laughs> I just want to say I mean, that unless on, you plan on exceeding the speed limit. I just want to <laughs> say that on Genius, the sixth verse of the song has three lines and the seventh verse has what I can only estimate to be at least 60 <laughs> well yeah that's the one where he's like, <laughs> like my favorite yeah. thing is underneath that too is a comment that simply eminem's been real quiet since this dropped <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah my favorite tracks <laughs> my favorite tra- <laughs> my favorite tracks on the record are still i don't think i talked about still enough but still is amazing and i really hope they give I can't, I don't know his name off the top of my head, but the other vocalist, more Cameron time Pitchin. to shine. Cause whenever he's, sh- yeah, whenever, whenever he's on there, he shines. Like he did, uh, he did Duster, he did near Detroit, did, like he did the screams and Duster, the near Detroit, Michigan screams. It, he just is such a powerhouse vocalist that Georgie Greep's weird delivery is so impressive that everyone focuses on that. But mm. no, like it's, you have to remember it's a two man show at that vocalist spot. Uh, Welcome to Hell is great. Uh, the defense and I'm gonna go with Sugar Zoo, uh, but Eat Man Eat was also. It's hard for me to choose between those because both of those are like both of those are, are have very similar structures where there's like a lot of really good melodic parts and then they all of a sudden go off into like these weird tangent bits and that's sort of they both are very strong in that aspect and I give it a nine out of ten. I. I think this is a great record. I think this is probably going to end up in my top five of the year, if not even higher than that. But right now, 
would I say it's like a perfect album? No, but it's certainly a figuring out album. And it's one of the best figuring out albums possible because if any other band that we didn't know about released this and then vanished off the planet of the earth, we'd say this was like innovative as hell. Mm-hmm. It's the only fact that we know this band can do even more that makes us go, wow, like I can't wow. wait for the next one instead of just focusing on this, you know? Wow. Um, unless wow. You, unless you're we Jake, in which real case, estate. unless you're Jake, in which case it's just like, nah this is this is the one you're all whack um mm-hmm. anyway I mean, you know, unless just, it's the next one just as an aside i think <laughs> that it's kind of funny that the drummer morgan simpson like we take how great he is like as such a given that we barely even mentioned him. oh yeah i mean well that's a thing it's just the goes without saying is so i mean percussive. i called him elvin jones with multiple oh, sorry. arms yes, i think did. that's well enough he, yes, he, to be enough. clear the percussion is so good that with all that it almost blends in with the jazz elements where you forget that like no this guy's been here since the beginning because of just like how much has been added to it that you forget that like oh the main trio is like still here morgan simpson is such a good drummer that he ended racism Damn. um all right that gives us an average overall of 8.3 for black midi's hellfire let us know at home what you think of this album, either the albums we discussed today, Black Midi's Hellfire and Lizzo's special. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your takes as well. <laughs> it Obviously, is a very interesting combo, I just realized. That is, imagine playing those right back to back in a car ride. Ima- in a long imagine car ride. A imagine my week. <laughs> uh, yes, and we want to say thanks again to Emily, of course, for joining us yet again. Of course, if you have not already, go and check out Emily's channel. Uh, Emily makes fantastic video essays, amazing film commentary, amazing media commentary in general. Go I, and check this stuff out. Really, really awesome. And we're really, really... I, I mentioned this last time I was on here, I think. But yeah, I released my uh, my favorite video I've ever released, uh, High Life, earlier this year. I'm yeah. working on the next video essay, which is sadly not the big one that I've been playing for a while. We couldn't make that one work. But... It's a new trans woman in cinema on Paris is burning. So I think people will be satisfied. Ooh, great film. Great, great film. And Can't I'm wait. planning on working on a uh, a new short for the next few days on the film, Both Sides of the Blade, the new Claire Denis film. Awesome. And Ooh, I'm looking forward to seeing um, that later this year. It's it, there, There's a lot of interesting stuff coming down the pipeline because I'm going to see Nope very soon. And I looked at all the films coming out this year and I had an anxiety attack looking at, <laughs> I was like, Oh, I forgot Killers of the Flower Moon is still slated to come out this year. And also the new Spielberg. Oh, uh, also check out my Twitch and Twitter and stuff. I'm going to be trying to stream more on Twitch. I just got something today. All the links will be below. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving a like and subscribing to the channel if you have not already. If you want to support us further, you can hit the join button and for just $1 a month, you can support the channel directly, get to be one of our besties. If you want to give us some music recommendations, then members of the channel will be able to do that and we will listen to and we will review them on the show. Plus, also you get your name featured in the title crawl of every video on this channel. But until next time, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Kellogg's Rice Krispies, snap, crackle, pop.